Good morning, everybody, and thanks for being here this morning. As you know, on March 22nd, Special Counsel Robert Mueller concluded his investigation into matters related to Russian attempts to interfere in our 2016 presidential election, and he submitted his confidential report to me pursuant to department regulations. As I said during my Senate confirmation hearing and since, I'm committed to ensuring the greatest degree possible of transparency concerning the special counsel's investigation consistent with the law. At 11 this morning, I'm going to transmit copies of the public version of the special counsel's report to the chairman and ranking members of the Senate and House Judiciary Committees. The Department of Justice will also make the report available to the American people by posting it on the department's website after uh, it has been delivered to Congress. I'd like to make a few comments today on the report. Before I do that, I want to thank uh, Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein for joining me here today and for his assistance and counsel throughout this process. Rod, as you know, has served at the department for nearly 30 years with dedication and distinction, and it's been a great privilege and pleasure for me to work with him since my confirmation. Uh, he had well-deserved plans to step back from public service that were interrupted by my asking him uh, to help in my transition. Rod has been an invaluable partner, and I am grateful that he is willing to help me and has been able to see the special counsel's investigation through to its conclusion. Thanks, Rod. Thank you. Yeah. I'd also like to thank special counsel Robert Mueller for his service and the thoroughness of his investigation, particularly his work exposing the nature of Russia's attempts to interfere in our electoral process. As you know, one of the primary purposes of the spe special counsel's investigation was to determine whether President Trump's campaign or any individual associated with it conspired or coordinated with the Russian government to interfere in the 2016 election. Volume one of the special counsel's report describes the results of that investigation. As you will see, the special counsel's report states that his Quote, investigation did not establish that members of the Trump campaign conspired or coordinated with the Russian government in its election interference activities. I am sure that all Americans share my concern about the efforts of the Russian government to interfere in our presidential election. As the special counsel report makes clear, the Russian government sought to interfere in our election process. But thanks to the special counsel's thorough investigation, we now know that the Russian operatives who perpetrated these schemes did not have the cooperation of President Trump or the Trump campaign, or the knowing assistance of any other American for that matter. That is something that all Americans can and should be grateful to have confirmed. The special counsel report outlines two main efforts by the Russian government to influence the 2016 election. First, the report details efforts by the Internet Research Agency, a Russian company with close ties to the Russian government, to sow social discord among American voters through disinformation and social media operations. Following a thorough investigation, of this disinformation campaign, the special counsel brought charges in federal court against several Russian nationals and entities for their respective roles in this scheme. Those charges remain pending and the individual defendants remain at large. But the special counsel found no evidence that any American, including anyone associated with the Trump campaign, conspired or coordinated with the Russian government or the IRA in this illegal scheme. Indeed, as the report states, quote, the investigation did not identify evidence that any U.S. person knowingly or intentionally coordinated with the IRA's interference operation, unquote. Put another way, the special counsel found no collusion by any Americans 
in IRA's illegal activities. Second, the report details efforts by the Russian military officials associated with the GRU, the Russian Military Intelligence Organization, to hack into computers and steal documents and emails from individuals associated with the Democratic Party and Hillary Clinton's campaign for the purpose of eventual, eventually publicizing these documents. Obtaining such unauthorized Following a thorough investigation of these hacking operations, the special counsel brought charges to federal court against several Russian military officers for their respective roles in these illegal hacking operations. Those charges are still pending and the defendants remain at large. But again, the special counsel's report did not find any evidence that members of the Trump campaign or anyone associated with the campaign conspired or coordinated with the Russian government in these hacking operations. In other words, there was no evidence of the Trump campaign collusion with the Russian government's hacking. The special counsel's investigation also examined Russian efforts to publish stolen emails and documents on the Internet. The special counsel found that after the GRU disseminated some of the stolen documents to entities that it controlled, DC Leaks and Guccifer II, the GRU transferred some of the stolen materials to WikiLeaks for publication. WikiLeaks then made a series of document dumps. The special counsel also investigated whether any member or affiliate of the Trump campaign encouraged or otherwise played a role in these dissemination efforts. Under applicable law, publication of these types of material would not be criminal unless the publisher also participated in the underlying hacking conspiracy. Here, too, the special counsel's report did not find that any person associated with the Trump campaign illegally participated in the dissemination of the materials. Finally, the special counsel investigated a number of links or contacts between the Trump campaign officials and individuals connected with the Russian government during the 2016 presidential campaign. After reviewing these contacts, the special counsel did not find any conspiracy to violate U.S. law involving Russian-linked persons and any persons associated with the Trump campaign. So that's the bottom line. After nearly two years of investigation, thousands of subpoenas, hundreds of warrants and witness interviews, the special counsel confirmed that the Russian government sponsored efforts to illegally interfere with the 2016 presidential election, but did not find that the Trump campaign or other Americans colluded in those efforts. After finding no underlying collusion with Russia, the special counsel's report goes on to consider whether certain actions of the president could amount to obstruction of the special counsel's investigation. As I addressed in my March 24th letter, the special counsel did not make a traditional prosecutorial judgment regarding this allegation. Instead, the report recounts 10 episodes involving the president and discusses potential legal theories for connecting those activities to the elements of an obstruction offense. After carefully reviewing the facts and legal theories outlined in the report and in consultation with the Office of Legal Counsel and other department lawyers, the Deputy Attorney General and I concluded that the evidence developed by the Special Counsel is not sufficient to establish that the President committed an obstruction of justice offense. Although the Deputy Attorney General and I disagreed with some of the Special Counsel's legal theories and felt that some of the episodes examined did not amount to obstruction as a matter of law, we did not rely solely on that in making our decision. Instead, we accepted the Special Counsel's legal framework for purposes of our analysis and evaluated the evidence as presented by the Special Counsel in reaching our conclusions. In assessing the President's actions discussed in the report, it is important to bear in mind the context. President Trump faced an unprecedented situation. 
As he entered into office and sought to perform his responsibilities as president, federal agents and prosecutors were scrutinizing his conduct before and after taking office and the conduct of some of his associates. At the same time, there was relentless speculation in the news media about the president's personal culpability. Yet, as he said from the beginning, there was, in fact, no collusion. And as the special counsel's report acknowledges, there is substantial evidence to show that the president was frustrated and angered by his sincere belief that the investigation was undermining his presidency, propelled by his political opponents, and fueled by illegal leaks. Nonetheless, the White House fully cooperated with the special counsel's investigation, providing unfettered access to campaign and White House documents, directing senior aides to testify freely, and asserting no privilege claims. And at the same time, the president took no act that in fact deprived the special counsel of the documents and witnesses necessary to complete his investigation. Apart from whether the acts were obstructive, this evidence of non-corrupt motives weighs heavily against any allegation that the president had a corrupt intent to obstruct the investigation. Now, before I take questions, I want to address a few aspects of the process for producing the public report that I am releasing today. As I said several times, the report contains limited redactions related to four categories of information. To ensure as much transpar tr transparency as possible, those redactions have been clearly labeled so that the, leaders can tell, uh, the readers can tell which redactions correspond to which categories. Now, as I, to, to, to recall, those categories are 6E material, grand jury material, information that uh, the IC uh, believes uh, would disclose sources and methods, information that would impair the investigation and prosecution of other cases that are underway, and finally, information that implicates the privacy and reputational interests of peripheral third parties. As you will see, most of the redactions were compelled by the need to prevent harm to ongoing matters and to comply with court orders prohibiting the public disclosure of information bearing on ongoing investigations and criminal cases, such as the IRA case and the Roger Stone case. These redactions were applied by Department of Justice attorneys working closely together with attorneys from the special counsel's office, as well as uh, the intelligence community, and prosecutors are handling the ongoing cases. The redactions are their work product. No redactions done by anybody outside this group. There were no redactions done by anybody outside this group. No one outside this group proposed any redactions, and no one outside the department has seen the unredacted report, with the exception of certain sections that were made available to IC, the intelligence community, for their advice on protecting intelligence sources and methods. Consistent with longstanding executive branch practice, the decision whether to assert executive privilege over any portion of the report rested with the President of the United States. Because the White House had voluntarily cooperated with the special counsel, significant portions of the report contained material over which the president could have asserted privilege. And he would have been well within his rights to do so. Following my March 29th letter, the Office of the White House Counsel requested the opportunity to review the redacted version of the report in order to advise the president on the potential invocation of privilege which is consistent with longstanding practice. Following that review, the President confirmed that in the interest of transparency and full disclosure to the American people, he would not assert privilege over the Special Counsel's report. Accordingly, the public report I am re releasing today contains redactions only for the four categories that I previously outlined, and no material has been redacted based on executive privilege. In addition, earlier this week, the President's personal counsel requested and was given 
the opportunity to read a final version of the redacted report before it was publicly released. That request was consistent with the practice followed under the Ethics in Government Act, which permitted individuals named in a report prepared by an independent counsel the opportunity to read the report before publication. The President's personal lawyers were not permitted to make and did not request any redactions. In addition to making the redacted report public, we are also working with Congress to accommodate their legitimate oversight interests with respect to the special counsel's investigation. We have been consulting with Chairman Graham and Chairman Nadler through this process, and we will continue to do so. Given the limited nature of the redactions, I believe that the publicly released report will allow every American to understand the results of the special counsel's investigation. Nevertheless, in an effort to accommodate congressional requests, we will make available subject to appropriate safeguards to a bipartisan group of leaders from several congressional committees, a version of the report with all redactions removed except those relating to grand jury information. Thus, these members of Congress will be able to see all of the redacted material for themselves with the limited exception of that which by law cannot be shared. I believe that this accommodation, together with my upcoming testimony before the Senate and House Judiciary Committees, will satisfy any need Congress has for information regarding the special counsel's investigation. Once again, I'd like to thank you for being here, and I will now have a few questions. Uh, Mr. Attorney General, we don't have the report in hand, so could you explain for us the special counsel's articulated reason for not reaching a decision on obstruction of justice and if it had anything to do with the department's longstanding guidance on not indicting a sitting president and you say you disagreed with some of his legal theories. What did you disagree with him on? Um, the, I, I, I'd leave it to his description in the report, the special counsel's own articulation of of why he did not want to make a determination as to whether or not there was an obstruction of fence. But I will say that when we met with him, uh, Deputy Attorney General uh, Rosenstein and I met with him along with Ed O'Callaghan, uh, who is the principal associate deputy, on March 5th, we specifically asked him about the OLC opinion and whether or not he was taking the position that he would have found a crime but for the existence of the OLC opinion. And he made it very clear several times that that was not his position. He, he was not saying that but for the OLC opinion he would have found a crime. He made it clear that he had not made the determination that there was a crime. Did you disagree with him on? May I follow up on that, Mr. Attorney General? What did you disagree with him on? Given that, uh, why did you and Mr. Rosenstein feel the need you had to take it to the next step to conclude that there was no crime, especially given that DOJ policy? Well, the very prosecutorial function and all our powers as prosecutors, including the power to convene grand juries and the compulsory process that's involved there, is for one purpose and one purpose only. It's determined yes or no. Was alleged conduct criminal or not criminal? That is, that is our responsibility, and that's why we have the tools we have. And we don't go through this process just to collect information and throw it out to the public. We collect this information. We use that compulsory process for the purpose of making that decision. And because uh, the special counsel did not make that decision, we felt the department had to, and that was a decision by uh, me and the deputy attorney general. Yes. Or did the special counsel indicate uh, that he wanted you to make the decision or that it should be left for Congress? And also, how do you respond to criticism you're receiving, receiving from congressional Democrats that you're acting more as a attorney for the president rather than uh, as the chief law enforcement officer? Well, uh, Special Counsel Mueller did not indicate that his purpose was to leave the decision to Congress. I hope that was not his view, since we don't convene grand juries and conduct criminal investigations for that purpose. Uh, 
he did not, I didn't talk to him directly about uh, the fact that we were making the decision, but I am told that his reaction to that was that it was uh, my, my prerogative as Attorney General to make that decision. Uh, Attorney General Bart Hathen here at Fox News. Hi there. Is there anything you can share today about your review of the genesis of the Russia investigation and whether assets have been provided to investigate? Uh, no, today I'm really focused just on the process of releasing this report. Democrats in Congress have asked for Robert Mueller himself to testify. Uh, Robert Mueller remains a Justice Department employee as of this moment. Will you permit him to testify publicly to Congress? I have no objection to Bob Mueller personally testifying. Uh, uh, Mr. Attorney General, it's not the Democrats who have questioned some of the process here. A Republican appointed judge on Tuesday said you have, quote, created an environment that has caused a significant part of the American public to be concerned about these redactions. You've cleared the president on obstruction. The president is fundraising off of your comments about spying. And here you have remarks that are quite generous to the president, including acknowledging his feelings and his emotions. So what do you say to people on both sides of the aisle who are concerned that you are trying to protect the president? Well, actually, the, the statements about his, his, his uh, sincere beliefs are, fr are, are recognized in the report that there was substantial evidence for that. So I'm not sure what your basis is for saying that I am being generous to the president. You think it just seems like there's a lot is, of effort to say, to, to go out of your way to acknowledge how this Well, is there, is there another precedent for it? No, but it's unusual. Okay, so that unprecedented is an accurate description, isn't it? Yes. Well, okay. What do you say to people who are concerned that you are trying to protect the president? Eric. Eric. There's a lot of public interest in the absence of the special counsel and members of his team. Was he invited to join you up on the podium? Why is he not here? This is his report, obviously, that you're talking about today. No, it's not. It's a report he did for me as the attorney general. He is required under the regulation to, pr to provide me with a confidential report. I'm here to discuss my response to that report and my decision, entirely discretionary, to make it public, since these reports are not supposed to be made public. That's what I'm here to discuss. Is propriety for you to come out and sort of what appears to be sort of spinning the report before public, the public gets a chance to read it? Okay. Thank you very much.